tuning in today. We're so thrilled and honored to have um, Erin here today talking about human design. Um, I'll explain a bit more on her bio. She'll go a bit more deeper before um, she dives into the session. So she's a human design expert um, who uses the personality assessment tool to help thousands of individuals and companies step into their work and their lives as their truest selves and their highest potential. Her work has attracted a growing community of over 50,000 who turn to her teachings for practical tools, digestible tips, and deeper self-knowledge to live with greater ease and authenticity every single day. We're so honored to have you today and to share your lessons with us. I'll pass it on to you and based on that. Perfect, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm excited to share about human design. So today is gonna be you know, informal. I wanna kind of walk you guys through all the key pieces. Um, but also, if you have questions as they as we go through, ask them in the chat. I'll make sure to answer them as we go. And then I'll also leave time for questions at the end. And I know that Hannah also sent some questions in advance. But um, so ask away. I want to make sure that you guys get your questions answered. Um, so for those unfamiliar and for everybody, the idea is that human design really gives us our energetic DNA. So it helps us understand how we're meant to make decisions, communicate, work within teams, cultivate relationships, literally all the things. And it gives us both the self-knowledge and the tools to really kind of step into who we are. So a lot of my work is with individuals, but also a lot of it's with teams to kind of really give them the blueprint to how they're designed to operate at their best. I think so often with human design, it's not about telling people stuff they don't know. It's like all the stuff they do know and haven't given themselves permission to step into. Um, so let me just put you guys on oh no. Yeah, gallery. Can you guys like, I know that we don't have everyone on video, but like for those who are in video, can you just like raise your hand if you feel like you're pretty familiar with it? A little bit. Okay, great. And who's totally new to it? Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, great. I love having the combo. So um, we have generator, reflector, projector. Amazing. If anybody needs me to repost the link to look up your human design, I will. And you don't have to, it's really useful to have, but if you wanna just kind of play along or listen along and see where you might fit, that's perfect as well. Um, so I've been working with human design for about five years. I live in New York and I was introduced to it very serendipitously. I was at a gathering on the Lower East Side and a guy sat next, my former business partner and first teacher sat next to me at a party and basically looked at my human design on his phone. Um, and started telling me all of the stuff about myself that felt so intuitive and felt like so like me, but it also felt like stuff I'd never really allowed myself to step into. And so there were three pieces he shared that night that were so just transformational for me. So for those familiar, I'm a projector, I'm an emotional projector. At the end of this, you guys are going to know what that all means. But basically he was like, Aaron, you're like, you're really not meant to do all the doing. He's like, you're a much better leader and guide and manager than you are a doer. And I had spent so much of my life trying to hustle and make things happen. So this felt like a very new way of operating. He also said, I really wasn't designed to do much of the initiating. He was like, for you, it's much better way to be invited in and recognized rather than kind of initiating and chasing after things. I had spent a lot of my life initiating. It also felt like a very new approach. And the third piece he shared was that I wasn't designed to make decisions in the moment or impulsively, but I was really meant to sleep on things and really give myself time to feel into things before I committed. And I had spent so much of my life making decisions so impulsively and moving so quickly. And so this felt like a very new approach. And so my experience that night, and I think my experience now with so many clients is that you know, there was just like a real sense of relief. I was like, I've spent a lot of my life trying to operate in the way that I thought I was supposed to. And you're telling me there's like a unique map for me in terms of how to find success in my own way. So it's been such a fun journey experimenting with it over the past five years and sharing it with so many people um, because it is so tactical. And so we're going to start today um, by exploring. So I think everybody has the link. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about today is the type and your inner authority. Um, and your strategy. And so, and we'll leave time for questions as well, but those are the pieces I would love for you guys to look up. So I'll kind of walk you through as we go through. Um, for those who have dug into human design, which I know is some of you, um, you might've discovered that it can be really complicated. There's so much information. It's kind of an endless study. Like it can go into all the areas of our life. And so today we're going to keep it really simple and explore how it is we choose and how it is make, we make decisions because every day we're making decisions from choosing to show up here. You know, say you're considering starting a new venture. How do you know what the right next step is? Say you're considering leaving a job. How do you know when the right timing is of other lovers or partners you might've chosen? How do you know if those people are actually right for you? And I think what human design has really taught me is that it is, not, it is not what we choose, but it is how. When we enter into things in ways that are really aligned with our design, we often find a whole lot more flow in our lives. And we enter into things in ways that are misaligned, we often experience so much more resistance. So it's such a powerful tool to kind of move us from a place of resistance into flow. 
Also, I'm going to give you guys a discount code at the end in case I forget. Um, so before we go into all the different types, the strategies, the authorities, kind of demystifying that chart, I would love for you guys to reflect, and you can share this in the chat or keep it to yourself, reflect on whether or not there are any areas in your life where it feels like you're experiencing a little bit of resistance, where it feels like things are just not quite flowing in the way that you like them to. It could be in your career, it could be a living situation, it could be romantic, but just kind of holding that example in your mind as we walk through today and asking yourself like, am I really living in my design in that area? You know, am I really kind of living authentically in that area? And just kind of using it as an exercise to be like, how could I find more flow here? Okay, so let's get into it. If anybody's having trouble with the link, let me know, but we're gonna start by talking about the five different types. So just so you guys have context, there are about 2 billion different configurations in human design. So it turns out everybody's incredibly unique and we all have our own map, but at the highest level, there are five different types. So there are manifesting generators, generators, projectors, reflectors, and manifestors. And so I think that I see every type represented here, except maybe manifestors. I don't know if we have a manifestor here. Um, so, and with every type will come a strategy. So I'm gonna share about your type and your strategy now. And also like, because this is the first distinction, you might be like, I resonate with pieces from a couple of different types. That's normal. Like we're not giving you the full picture of your unique design because there's no way to in this kind of setting, but just kind of listen and, and start to see how it feels. And so manifesting generators and generators make up the majority of the population. These are really the people that have the energy and the life force to kind of build and create and make things happen. They're really kind of meant to wake up in the morning with a full tank of energy to use up their energy in super satisfying ways throughout the day and then kind of crash and wake up, wake up recharge. If they haven't fully exhausted their tank, they might go to bed and just feel like restless because they're like, I'm gonna use my energy in a way that feels satisfying or even just depleted because they haven't actually used their energy in a way that feels good. Um, the more they commit their energy to things that naturally energize them and light them up, whether it's friendships or aspects of their work, the more they're kind of creating energy for everybody around them. So it's so advantageous to the world that they have incredibly strong boundaries and are saying yes to what they really do enjoy and letting go of the things that are kind of consistently depleting and draining them. Um, and so the difference between the two is that manifesting generators often thrive when they have their energy in a lot of things at once. These people are kind of multi-passionate by nature and are not meant to do just one thing. It's, these are my clients that are like, I'm a lawyer, I own a dance studio, I'm a mom. Like they're just doing all the things and that is so much of their magic. And often they move very quickly, but in doing so they can skip a few steps along the way. So it's good to work with and be around people that kind of support them in this step-by-step -step process so they can kind of be in this powerful and creative flow. Generators are more about mastery. It's like really kind of doing this one thing and then when it's time moving on. But for both types, like they have this amazing energy to build and create. It's all about channeling it into the right thing. Every type will have a strategy. So the strategy for both generators and manifesting generators is magnetism. They're not really meant to chase after things. Life is meant to come to them. Their work is to kind of open up their awareness and pay attention to what's showing up and kind of let their gut response, let them know where to put their energy and when. It's not a passive thing. It's not like they're sitting on their couch being like, when is it all coming? It's like being so busy doing what they love, creating that magnetism and then kind of keeping their eyes open. And once they get that gut response, they can go make something happen. It doesn't have to be an invitation. They could like see somebody on Instagram, like, I want to reach out to them. You know, they could be listening to a talk and they're like, oh my God, I want to reach out to this person. Or they could see a job posting and be lit up by it. But they're basically letting that gut kind of guide them towards what they're available for and when. And the last piece I'll share about both generators and manifesting generators is that because they have all this amazing vitality and life force and energy, people can really wanna take advantage of it. And not necessarily in a malicious way, it's just like, oh, like you can handle this or you could do this. And it's just like, their energy is so precious and it is finite. So as much as you can, like being like, my gut is gonna let me know what I'm available for and when, and I've gotta really trust that and not say yes to things just because I think that I have the energy or because somebody wants me to. Because I know the more I commit my energy to things that I enjoy, the more energy I create for myself and everyone around me. And so the actual last piece I would share is that I would encourage both of these types to really take inventory. What are the aspects of your life, the aspects of your work, your friendships, your relationships that are lighting you up and energizing you the most? And can you put more energy into those things? And what are the things that are the most draining, the most depleting, the most exhausting? Can you pull your energy out of those things? Do you guys have any questions on either of these types or does it resonate? Does it feel like totally out there before we move on to the projector piece? Resonates? Okay, anything not clear? I'd be curious for you guys to reflect and you guys don't need to share, but you know, reflecting on whether or not you guys really do trust that things will come to you or whether or not you guys feel like you do most of the initiating. And I have a question for the types. Like, does it yeah. happen easily that people mistype or that they change their type over the course of their life? No, so human design is based on your exact time, date, and place of birth. So there's just one. 
So often we are not operating um, in accordance with our type. Often we're trying to be things that we're not. Like I was trying to be a generator my whole life, but you are one thing your whole life. It doesn't mean that like you're stagnant. Like human design kind of gives us our operating system, um, but we can choose how to express that however we like, you know? And so like as a generator, it's like you are here to be a builder, creator, doer, where you channel that energy might evolve, of course, over time, but you are meant to be magnetic. You're kind of meant to like let things come to you and trust your gut to know where to put your energy. Beautiful. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Okay. It definitely resonates. This perfectly describes me. Great. I'm a projector and often try to make it all happen. So let's talk about our projectors because I feel you. So projectors are about 20% of the population. And remember, this is the first distinction. There's so much more to it. But projectors are really the ones that are here to kind of be the leaders, the guides, the advisors, the teachers, not here to do all the doing. And so as projectors, our energy really operates in ebbs and flows. The kind of joke, but reality is that we're meant to work three hours a day. I know that's like not always feasible or desirable. I know I work more than that now, but at the very least, just like leveraging the energy and it's there resting when it's not and not deriving your worth from how hard you're working or how much you're doing. You know, you're not meant to just like sustain your energy all day long. It's just like your worth is not in how much you do. It's in your perspective and the way that you see the world. Often projectors are so wise about energy. They're very sensitive to energy and it's part of what makes them amazing leaders and guides and CEOs because they can kind of really um, tune into how to best leverage the people around them. They often can also make amazing coaches and therapists and psychologists because they're so good at guiding and supporting other people, not because they're telling them what to do, but because they're asking the right questions. They're giving them things to respond to. Um, And often projectors love systems, love any system that kind of helps them understand people, helps them understand all the things. Human design was such a fun one for me because of that. And the strategy for us as projectors is waiting for a sense of recognition and invitation. The idea is that because you bring such a unique and different energy to the table, it is so important for you to feel recognized and invited in to share your gift rather than kind of like initiating again and just like chasing after and trying to make it happen. Um, Because if you're brought into a company and expected up like a generator, you might not be great at it. So asking yourself, where do I feel the most recognized? Where do I feel the most invited in? In what friendships, relationships, in my romantic partnership at work? Um, I think when I first discovered this, I was like, how in the world am I supposed to build a business waiting for an invitation? Like it feels far more passive. And I learned that so much of my job as a projector is about making myself visible and available for invitations. So rather than kind of like pitching or reaching out to specific people, it's sharing about what I do in a really broad way and letting the right people find me. So for me, that's been on Instagram, talks, newsletters, just like podcasts, just like sharing, 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 because like, honestly, I love sharing. And then it like attracts the right people to me. And the first kind of iteration of my human design company in 2015, I was like, we were pitching specific companies. It was just like going nowhere, you know? And so like, I think when projectors just share so authentically in such an inspired way, like what they're thinking about and what they're exploring, it just like, it becomes so magnetic. Um, And it doesn't always have to be super formal. Like it might be an energetic thing, but it's like, yeah, I feel really recognized by this person. I'm going to lean into it even more. Um, And also knowing that sometimes invitations can come with an expiration date. And so it feels like something's no longer working. Asking yourself, do I still feel invited in? Do I still feel recognized? So let me know if you guys have any projector questions. Ariel says, I was always chasing things and exhausted. And when I found out I was a generator, I was like, exactly. You know, it's just like, we just try to be all the things that we're not. I used to always feel guilty for not being able to be on all the time. How can projectors make what? Yes, exactly. So I think you asked that literally right when I was answering that because you were tuned into it, which is great. But I think, again, it's just like make it your job to let people know that you exist. Like hone the thing, hone your craft, and then like share it with the world. You know, often it does require that we kind of recognize ourselves first, that it's just like, okay, we recognize our value, we recognize our unique perspective, and then we kind of let people know whether it's our friends, whether it's a broader community, that it's a thing that we're excited about. I love this. My daughter is a projector, and um, so I'll focus on recognition with her and feel, and I feel this when she tries to make friends. Exactly. And sometimes as projectors, we're like so desperate for recognition that we're like, see me, I want to like be seen by everyone. And then it's just like too pushy for people and they don't want it, you know, because our energy as projectors is really penetrating. Our gift is in making people feel very seen and recognized, but if they're not ready for it, it feels like too much. And so I think as, so yeah, so star, you know, noticing like just noticing how that shows up in the dynamics with her friends and also, yeah, recognizing her being like, what are the like unique, what's her unique way of seeing the world? What are the unique things she brings to the table? And how can I let her know that I see those things and I value those things? How can I invite her in the share? Um, when you were, okay. When you were talking about manifesting generators, I thought my type was wrong, but hearing you talk about projectors, I am spot on, but might try to be a manifesting generator more often. Yes, exactly. 
Um, I definitely was trying that most of my life. Would events, maybe ads versus explicit direct um, invites be a route for projectors? You know, I think that, so maybe can you clarify that, Stephanie? I don't, I'm not sure I totally understand. So explicit, explicit directed invites, like if we're actually pitching ourselves, maybe I just wanna make sure I'm answering the right question. Um, thinking of lead gen for business. So this is actually gonna be specific to some other aspects of our design because some people like are more meant to kind of build their business through just like their community, their network. Like this is obviously such a good example of that, especially if you have like a four in your profile, um, which we might talk about at the end. So people say that outreach is the way to go. Um, you know, I think it, it will be specific. I would just say that whatever kind of outreach you do, whether it's just like to podcasts or whether it's just telling your friends, like rather than be like, I'm trying to pitch you on this thing or sell you on this thing. It's more just like, you know what? Like, I love this work. I'm doing this work. Like, I'm just letting you know that I exist, you know, just kind of making your job again to like make yourself visible. Even if you are directly outreaching, I found more success when I'm just like very broadly showing about what I do and kind of let the right people find me, but that's worked for me. But some other aspects of our design will speak more specifically to this. How should projectors approach dating? Um, you know, I never want human design to feel like a tool that limits us. I think it's meant to be like the most empowering tool in the world. So I don't think it's a thing where you're like just sitting and you're like, I don't know how to find somebody. I would just like, if you're on apps, for example, I'd be like, okay, do I feel recognized? Do I feel appreciated by this person? Okay, if so, I'll lean in even more. Like I just started like dating my best friend because I already felt so kind of recognized by him in such a deep way. So I think that the profile is gonna speak a little bit more to this, but I would just continually ask yourself the question every step along the way, like, do I feel recognized and appreciated and invited in by this person? And if I do, I'll keep leaning in more. Um, it has always felt so weird to pitch myself, so this makes sense, exactly. Reframing it as just sharing. I'm just creating value, letting people know I exist. I'm excited by these things. Um, okay. So for those just joining, welcome. We're going through the types right now. And so the link was just posted if you want to look it up. So let's talk about manifestors. I don't think we have any manifestors here. Um, but manifestors are really the ones that are here to initiate, the people that are here to kind of get things started, get the ball rolling, make things happen. Not always here to do all the doing, but here to just get things started. You know, often manifestors need a lot of freedom and autonomy and control. They're really not here to be told what to do or guided or managed in any way. They're very much here to do things on their own terms and in their own way. And they can feel very kind of limited if they're being told what to do. Um, and so, and they are here to initiate, but not always here to do all the doing. So having the right support to kind of help people kind of provide the energy to continue sustaining something. I find they often succeed if they're working for a company when they're just given that freedom. It's like, this is your domain, do what you please, let us know how it goes. Or if they're kind of working for themselves and naturally charting their own path. Um, they tend to be very naturally innovative and kind of see the future and feel like everyone else is like a little bit behind the times. And they often are also very comfortable with solitude where it's just like they're pretty comfortable being left alone to do what they please. So the strategy for manifestors is all about initiating. They are here to initiate and get things started. So they're not here to wait for anyone else to kind of, or thing to come to them, but also about informing. So what I mean by informing is that if they just kind of go about their business initiating and don't let people know what they're gonna do before they do it, people can become very resistant. But if they just give people a heads up, like I've decided to go this direction with this project, I'm coming home from work late, I bought a new fridge. Like if they're just like letting people know what they do before they do it, it creates so much more ease in their life. And so this is often the least natural thing in the world for manifestors, but I would really encourage you once you make a decision to reflect on who are all the people that are gonna be impacted by this decision and how can I let them know before I do it? you're not asking for permission and you're not telling them why you're doing what you're doing. You're literally just like, I'm giving you a heads up that I've chosen to do this thing. I had a post about a manifesto recently on Instagram and this woman shared, she's like, you know, I like bought a new fridge. I like didn't even think to tell my partner, you know? And then she was like, Oh, like well, the fridge is coming. And he was just like, what? You know, it's just like, it's such a simple thing that it's just like, by the way, I've done this thing. You know, I have another client who's father, sorry, the, her husband is a manifester. And when he just leaves the room without telling their two-year-old son, the two-year-old son will like freak out. But when he's just like, I'm leaving the room, I'm going upstairs. The son's like, okay. You know, so just like, know that your energy is very impactful. I know we don't have any manifestors here, but just that informing is meant to make your life so much easier. Okay. I know we have one reflector, which is exciting. So this is so insightful. Finding out that someone I've been working with closely with is a manifester and I'm a generator. Exactly. See why we've clashed at times. So knowing that like as a generator, it's going to be good for them to ask you questions, give you things to respond to. And as a manifester, it's like informing them, giving them freedom, autonomy, and control. You know, there are so many layers in human design. Obviously, like understanding your individual design is, the, is so useful. Um, but then you can also layer charts on top of each other and start to understand like your partnership dynamic. You can layer teams charts on top of each other and start to understand kind of the collective dynamics. So there's just like so much insight into how can we best honor the differences, both of ourselves and the people around us. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about reflectors. So reflectors are 1%, which is why I said it's so exciting that we have one here, Jessica. So basically reflectors are really our collective mirrors. These are people that are incredibly sensitive to their physical environment and always kind of taking in everything in their space. So one of the best and kind of mirroring it back. So you really get a good sense of how a community is doing or a team is doing just by how their reflector is showing up. They're kind of magnifying whatever is there. And so it's so important for reflectors to be such a ruthless curator of the spaces they're in and the people they're surrounding themselves by because they're going to magnify all that energy. So making sure their home feels good, their office feels good, their city feels good. If they go to a restaurant, it doesn't feel good, leave. Like just like the space has to feel good. And also part of the magic of reflectors is that their identity is always changing and evolving and adapting. They're going to have periods where they feel like a generator, like a manifesting generator like a projector, like a manifester. So the work is to not try to put themselves into a box, but let themselves be, let themselves be all the things. It's like today I feel like this and tomorrow I feel like this and around these people I feel like this. So the gift is in your fluidity and not in your consistency. For reflectors, it is equally important to kind of be around people as it is to kind of be alone. So being around people, but also pulling away and kind of being in your own energy. And in the context of business, we call reflectors evaluators because their perspective is just so objective and different. They can often just see things that other people miss. Whenever I'm working with a reflector, I'm just like, so what do you think about this? And what do you see about this? I'm just like asking them questions all the times because all the time because their perspective is so unique. So I always see the best place for them within a company, which I know is like an impossible job to apply for is like the like CEO whisperer where they're just kind of like in the CEO's ear, just like whispering all the things that they see, but in a place where like their perspective is so valued, so invited in. Okay. Let me know if you guys have any reflector questions. If not, we're gonna move on to the inner authority. So if you look up your design, you'll see the type and the strategy, which we've gone through. Now we're gonna talk about the inner authority and the inner authority is how we're meant to make decisions. If you see what yours is, type it in. It should be something like sacral, splenic, emotional, self-projected. Um, excited for this part, yes. Sacral, sacral, so many sacral people. Okay, great, cool. So. This is actually what like really drew me to human design because it was just, you know, human design can feel so cosmic. It's like comes from the stars. It comes from our birth information, but the information itself is like so tactical and so grounded and so practical. And I just like, I needed that actual piece and how we make decisions is like, we're making decisions literally every single day, you know? And so human design reminds us that we're all meant to make decisions so differently. And none of us are meant to make decisions from our mind. None of us are meant to create a pro con list of like, I should do this because of this and I shouldn't because of this. It's like, there's actually a more innate knowing that we're all designed to tap into a little bit differently. Um, so let's start with, and it requires that we kind of get out of our minds, which I know is like often uncomfortable because it's often what we've relied on to make decisions. So we're going to start with our sacral decision makers. So we have a lot of them here. And it's also just such a good reminder. There's like so much advice out there of like, you should sleep on things. You should follow your gut. And I just like, I laugh so much when I see it because I'm like, that is so true for you. But it's just like, we all have just like a unique blueprint. So all the follow your gut out there is so true for all of our sacral decision makers. I do not even have a gut response. I don't know what it feels like. I see that advice and I'm just like, can't do anything about it. If you are a sacral decision maker, which is only possible for generators and manifesting generators, it means that you are meant to trust your gut response in the moment. The gut is a very visceral feeling in your belly. You're either going to feel kind of an expansion towards something or contraction away. It's like an excited buzz or an uncomfortable nod. It's like your body opening up, shutting down. It could be an uh-huh in your voice, uh-uh. The gut is not a thing that you can rationalize. If you find yourself giving reason for a decision, like I should take this client because of this, I should stay in this relationship because of this, like that is not your gut speaking. Your gut is like, this thing feels right or it doesn't. I don't know why, but we'll find out why later. If you're not getting a full body gut response, that either means it is not the right thing or it is not the right time yet. It is much a tool. It is as much a tool to help you know where to put your energy as it is a tool to help you know when to put it there. You might be like, does it feel right? Does it feel right? Does not feel right? And then like, it feels right. Um, and then the, one of the best ways to kind of access the gut response is to have the people around you ask you very specific questions. So instead of asking you an open-ended question, so for example, my partner's a sacral generator. So if I say, what do you want to eat for dinner? He's just like, I don't know, Aaron. But I'm like, do you want to go out or cook at home? Do you want to make sweet potatoes or cauliflower? Like if I give him options, if I give him something to respond to, he's like, I want that. I don't want that. And it works for work too. It's like, you want this or this. So just like giving these people options, giving them things to respond to is such a powerful way for them to just like get out of their head and be like, feels right or it feels it doesn't feel right and so having things to respond to can be really useful so i would be encourage the sacral decision makers to reflect on one do you feel connected to your gut response does it feel like a thing that's like alive within you and two does it feel like something that you trust 
and we're going to move on to our emotional decision makers. So if you're an emotional decision maker, which is possible for actually every single type but reflectors, it means that you are not designed to make decisions impulsively or in the moment, but actually over time. So if you are a generator and, or a manifesting generator and you are an emotional decision maker, you also have that gut response. But it's not meant to be a thing that you trust in the moment, you trust your gut response over time. For anyone that's emotional, we're kind of always riding these emotional waves. We're like highs and lows and highs and lows. And the most important thing is to not make decisions on the high or the low of the wave. If we're on the high, we might, I know personally, I say yes to all the things and then I wake up the next day and I'm like, what in the world did I commit to? You know, if I'm on the low, I might say yes to too little. So just giving yourself a little bit of a buffer time. So yeah, emotional soul reflex is, is the same here. So giving yourself a little bit of a buffer time to really kind of make sure that like you consistently feel good about a thing you want. It's not like an indefinite, like I'm going to just wait for a month. It's like, I'm going to give myself like one to three days and see if I'm still excited about the thing. So just giving yourself a little bit of space to move somewhere else in your emotional wave and see if you're still excited by it. So sleeping on things is going to be the best thing for these people. Like time is medicine for you. It's just like always asking for more time. I think that I was so fearful early on that like I would lose opportunities if I asked for more time. And I find that when I ask for more time, it's just like more opportunities emerge or they become better or they emerge in some way or they just kind of like morph. And it's also so useful to know what your partner, your kid, your colleagues are. Because for example, my partner, who's also my business partner, makes those kind of quick in the moment gut responses. Whereas like, I got to sleep on things. I got to feel into things. Like if I try to keep up with him, I would probably regret so many of my decisions. So it's just understanding that difference has been so useful. And there's such a beautiful emotional depth that these people come to over time when they give themselves the space to really feel into it. So I would encourage our emotional people to reflect, like, do you feel like you take your time when you make decisions? Or do you feel like you're a little bit more impulsive? And how do you think that generally works out for you? Because I think that like, I, I will always have like an intuitive knowing in the moment, but I just like, it's not always a thing that I can trust. And it's by giving myself time that I confirm that it's really the right thing to move forward with. Okay, let's talk about splenic. So <clears throat> For the splenic decision makers, this is only possible for manifestors or projectors. And so if you are a splenic decision maker, it's all about trusting your intuition in the moment. Intuition is different than the gut response. Gut response is that visceral feeling in your belly that kind of responds to questions. It's opening and closing. Splenic is like a very quiet, intuitive knowing. It's just like a voice that you hear, tingles that you feel, resonance with something that you feel, and it's very spontaneous. It disappears as quickly as it comes. So the work for the splenic decision makers is splenic decision makers is basically to get quiet enough to hear their intuition and then just courageous enough to act when it comes. Um, and so the work is to really get quiet, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through journaling, um, whether it's through, you know, just time away from people, but just like, it is so spontaneous. You're kind of the opposite of the emotional people in some way, where the emotional people need to sleep on things and feel into things, whereas splenic people can trust their intuition in the moment. And so often my clients that have this are like, oh, I feel like I need to sleep on things, but really like they're meant to be so spontaneous, so impulsive. So I would encourage the splenic people to reflect on whether or not they feel connected to their intuition, whether it feels like something they hear, and two, whether it feels like something that they trust. Jessica, it's actually not possible to be a reflector and splenic. So I would check if you're, if you know that your type is a reflector, then you're going to be a lunar authority. Um, if you are a projector or a manifester, you could be splenic. So um, if you want to send me the photo, you can, but that's not a possible combination. Um, so I would double check the type there, but splenic is only possible for manifestors and projectors. So, okay, let's talk about self. So I think we had one here. Um, so if you are a self-projected decision maker, this is only possible for projectors. Um, it basically means, I see that Jessica, it's really, it's actually, it's just not possible. So if you send me an image, let me look at it because um, then I'll be able to see exactly what it is. So I don't know if you can post images in here, maybe not. Um, yeah, just send me the screenshot um, if you can post it in here because, yeah, it, I've, it's just not possible for it to show up that way. Um, so if you are um, a self-projected decision maker, basically means that for you, it's really useful to kind of like verbally process and talk things out. The best thing that you can do when you make a decision is surround yourself by people that you trust and just let yourself talk. Your truth comes when you give it a voice. And it's so like having a therapist, having a coach, having friends that you trust, a partner, like opportunities to talk, opportunities to talk things out can be so useful. 
um, even voice recording, journaling, and also your decision making is so connected to your identity. So asking yourself questions like, will this decision like allow my self expression? Like, will it make me happy? Will it move me in the right direction? Will it allow my creativity? So just knowing that your truth comes when you give it a voice so as much as you can giving it a voice. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I know we don't have all the other ones represented here, but let me just give you guys a, a couple examples here. So if you are an ego decision maker, which is only possible for kind of manifestors and projectors, it means that you're designed to make decisions based on whether or not your heart is really in something. And so asking yourself, like, is my heart in it? And also doing this, making decisions based on whether or not you really have the willpower or the fortitude to do something. Um, so asking yourself, like, do you have the energy for this thing? And also being like healthily selfish in your decision making. Like you really need to make decisions that truly take care of you. And so being like, does this decision actually really take care of me? Um, and so those are ego people. We have mental projectors um, that also need to talk things out, but they're incredibly sensitive to their physical environment. So it's also all about being in the right physical space and talking things out in those spaces and being in a few different environments as they do it. And then for reflectors, um, so Jessica, I don't know if you have my email. Your name looks familiar, so maybe you do. If you need me to send it to you, I will, so I can look at your chart. But um, if you are a reflector, your decision-making is lunar. And it basically means that you're designed to give yourself a full 30 days before you make a big decision, which is like always so wild to me. But the idea is that like clarity comes when you give it a lot of time, but when you sample a decision from so many different angles before you commit. So I know it's not always possible to give yourself a full 30 days, but I think for reflector, reflectors, I would really encourage you to kind of just like make sure you're not around people that are pressuring you to make a decision more quickly than is natural for you. And knowing that clarity comes when you give it a lot of space and a lot of sampling. Okay, so I'm gonna close and then open up for questions. I know that Hannah again sent me some. Um, also, let me just see. Yeah, so Jessica, you're a projector. So the type is projector, not reflector. Um, so you are a splenic projector. So we don't actually have any reflectors here, but so, um, so okay. So to close, um, so the idea with human design is that it really is meant to just like give us permission to be who we are. And like, it really is a science of understanding ourselves. And once we understand our human design, we can use it in every decision that we make from how we're picking friends and choosing opportunities and choosing jobs and literally all the things. And it really gives us a language and a framework to find our flow. And there's so many different layers that just like continually give us permission to be who we are. And I think what drew me to human design is that I think for so long, we've been looking for authority outside of ourselves in terms of teachers and guides and gurus and human design just kind of returns that authority to us. Basically is that we can't actually find the answers outside of us. It's just tapping into our own inner authority so we can enter into things consistent and reliably, reliably every single time. And I think in the form of partnership or teams, it helps us understand how unique and different each person is and how to really honor those differences. Um, and so if you guys want to go deeper, I'm Erin Claire Jones everywhere. I share a lot on Instagram, my website, and then I'll type in the discount code here. Um, one of my offerings is something called the Blueprint, which is basically a 30-page PDF on your unique design that covers all the pieces we talked about today and like so much more. And it's just meant to kind of be your operating manual that you can keep returning to to kind of find alignment. I always say we come into the, to this life without a manual and human design just like quite literally gives us the manual. So um, the link for that is here and the discount code is dreamers. Um, and then I'm hosting a three hour workshop on Friday night to dive really deep into all the different energy centers. And then I also do sessions as well. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? And I'll also look at Hannah's email too. Um, but type in the questions here. Okay. And I also um, just reviewed the um, the questions that she had sent. And most of them you actually covered um, very um, effectively. Um, the one thing potentially that you could dive in a bit more is um, how to identify weaknesses and a need um, within partnerships specifically. Um, in a partnership. Yeah. That was one thing. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, I think that when we look at the, you know, partnership is so interesting because it's just like, I think that we often are attracted to things that we're not. So we often, whether it's romantic or business, often find ourselves working with people of different types. And we can, of course, work with people of similar types. But I think really just like it's so specific, but understanding the differences and how they're meant to make decisions and how you're impacting each other and where you might be triggering each other and where you have similarity, like all that stuff is just so revealing. I think something that's really interesting to look at is what we call our open centers. So um, the open center, so somebody asked, uh, somebody asked, okay, um, I have seven open centers and only defined throat and G center. So 
this is actually what the workshop on Friday goes into, but basically there are nine different energy centers and each of those centers will either be colored in or open. The areas that are colored in is kind of where you're drawing your energy from and the areas that are white and open are the areas where you are the most sensitive and vulnerable to other people's energy. And so those are often the most interesting things to look in partnership of like, am I taking in someone else's emotions or fears or thoughts or way of communicating or stresses and kind of understanding what's yours and what's not. And so those open centers are such a powerful tool to help you know like where you are the most likely to get taken off track, but also where you have the greatest capacity for wisdom. And so an example, like if you have an open emotional center, it means that like you're like a hyper empath and so sensitive to other people's emotions. And um, the shadow of this is not knowing what's yours and what someone else's and kind of just like taking other people's stuff, making decisions based on other people's emotions. And the wisdom is being like so empathetic, but having very strong boundaries. It's like, I know you're feeling this and I can help give you language for that stuff, but I'm not going to take it on as my own. Or knowing that you might like be vulnerable with an open root center to be kind of be taking on other people's stress. And so you're always in a hurry trying to get everything done because you're taking on other people's stress. And so, so much of the work is slowing down and not hurrying for all the things. So going through each of those centers is just so revealing. I think for me, you know, I, I only actually have two open centers as a projector, but it's just like, those are the areas where I can get the most taken off track and it's such a reminder to kind of stay in alignment. Is the blueprint the same for every type? No, I made thousands. None of them are the same. They're all like just so wildly different. So the blueprint goes through your type, your strategy, your authority. It goes through how you're designed to process information. We call it your definition. It goes through each of your open centers where you can get taken off track. You're not self. It goes through all those different channels and innate strengths, your profile, how you're here to manifest your purpose, the teams you work best, and the kind of questions to work with all of it. So totally unique to you. And yeah, once you get your blueprint in the confirmation email, there's a link to submit your birth information. Um, all so interesting. I'm surprised how accurate it was to me. I mean, it's just, and I work with so many skeptics because I work with so many teams and it's really just so interesting because I think that even if people are a little bit resistant initially, often the information itself resonates in such a deep way that they're like, I don't actually care where it comes from because it just feels right. And so I think that human design tends to resonate on just like such a cellular level and just like it's, I think that I was a little bit nervous when I first started working with human design that people would feel like restrictive, like it like would put them in a box in some way, but I haven't really seen that. It's actually like people are just like, oh, this just like empowers me to be me because it doesn't, it's not predictive. It doesn't tell us our future. It just like tells us what is the way to operate that's most authentic to us. Um, now it says inner authority, none. Yeah, I need to look at your chart. I don't, let me know if you're a reflector or a projector. I'm not sure where you landed there. None of it is sad. I hate the word none, but that is basically either going to be around the fact that you're a lunar, that you need to give yourself time or that you need to kind of, yeah. So the reflector one that I talked about is just that clarity comes with time, giving yourself period to kind of feel things over as long a period as you can to kind of wait for that clarity to emerge. And in that waiting period, sounding things out and giving yourself an opportunity to kind of process. In terms of Raquel's question, can your upbringing potentially affect your design? So, you know, our upbringing is like, it's our conditioning. It affects us in all the ways, you know? So human design doesn't tell us like what kind of childhood we'll have, where we might be affected, but often the open centers are where we're going to take in the most conditioning. And so learning those open centers is a way to kind of really reconnect to who we are because so often we've just like gotten a little bit off track because we're trying to be all the things that we're not. So it can absolutely impact your design and impact how you're showing up. And what human design really gives us is just kind of like, our energetic kind of blueprint of how we can operate at our best. But so often, like I said, we haven't felt permission to do that. And it's so interesting. I work a lot with kind of parents as well and kids. And like, it's so, it's such a powerful tool in parenting because you're basically like giving kids permission to be who they are from day one, you know, which is like, just like the most empowering thing in the world. And you're going to parent a manifestor different than you parent a generator, different than you parent a projector, parent a projector, all of that. Um, right angle cross of planning. So this is going to actually talk about some other more specific things. This is kind of like a very, a very strategic cross. There are 192 incarnation crosses. So it's a little bit hard to go into. There's an amazing book called the book of destinies, which is a good resource for that. The incarnation cross is such a personal thing. Like it's actually not a very actual piece of our design. So it's not often a piece that I share about. It's a good thing that I think that you can kind of return to, to just check and see if you're on track and often just manifest more naturally in life later in life when you're in alignment. Like mine is just all about saying the same thing over and over again, which is just like what I do all day, every day. So like reading it, it's just like, okay, I'm on track. I'll keep going. But the profile aspect of our design is actually a much more actional piece to kind of get there. The incarnation cross literally just happens, you know? And so it's just like kind of by aligning that with the other parts of our design, design that it kind of manifests more organically. Stephanie said, and what about twins with the same human design? I have a twin brother, but we we're also delivered via C-section. So 
you guys, if you were born at the same time, you guys are going to have very similar designs. Yes. It doesn't mean that you'll express them the same at all. You know, again, it's just like, I work with a lot of twins too. It's like, they might express and show up in such different ways, but yeah, like maybe you guys both have a gut response or maybe both of you need that invitation and maybe one of you is really in alignment and maybe the one of you is not. Um, but it is like how you express it is going to be so differently. It's going to show up so differently. Okay. Do you guys have any more questions? Did you look up yours? Keisha, no? Yeah. Um, I'm waiting for my mom to let me know when I was born. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, she, she was, I was born through a cesarean, so um, I'm trying to get the exact time. Yeah. It's just, it's so, yeah, and it's so interesting because I think that it's, you know, it's kind of fun with companies because they're so used to, like, answering all the um you know, answering all the questionnaires about who they are and human design is just like, we just want your exact time, date and place of birth. So there's something that kind of really simplifies it about that. Um, That's so powerful. And I, I have known Erin um, for a few years now. So I knew her before she started human design, but from an outsider, like just like how you've embraced life and how much more you are in flow. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing, it's working extremely well. And um, the fact that you've attracted so many individuals to yeah. your lessons is like really powerful. No, oh, good. I know. You see me through all the things. You know, I think that like one of my biggest shadows of the projector, and this is actually going to be true for all manifestors, projectors, and reflectors, is just like overdoing things. It's just like becoming overzealous and like just like working so hard and literally not knowing when to stop. And I think that like, and so it's so easy to feel like a super generator and then just burn out. So I think it really gave me so much permission to just know that like, that's not where my worth really came from and kind of digging into this. But yeah, it's been a journey. I mean, it always is. But I think that, um, you know, and that's the magic of human design too, is that it's like, you don't have to align with your design. Like just because I tell somebody they're a manifester doesn't mean they have to operate like one, but it often just like feels, life just feels better and often so much more successful when they actually do. Cool. Thank you so much. Do you, this, this was so, so powerful. And thank you for yeah. sharing so generously your knowledge. Does anyone have any final questions? Um, and just make sure that you grab the links that Erin um, shared in terms of the blueprint and her workshop coming up. Um, and so that you can learn more. And otherwise you can just go find the, that on your website as well, right? Mm -hmm. The workshop's not on the website, but everything else is. But you guys can also message me on Instagram. Such a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Have to follow her. Um, thank you so much, Erin. Thank you everyone for tuning in. This was fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Okay, awesome. Have a great Bye. day. Bye.